So we're in Romans, and for those of you who've uh, studied Romans or looked at Romans, um, anywhere in Romans really, uh, you're going to get a lot of contrasts, right? You're going to get a lot of Paul talking about law versus grace, uh, but, but really more a lot about law. What is law? Um, different angles and viewpoints of law. And, and it's interesting because who Paul is, is he knows laws. And he knows the spiritual laws. He knows laws of the Jewish faith. And he knows the Mosaic laws. And some of the things I kind of want to get rooted right now with you guys is that um, when we're in this passage in, in chapter 6, a couple weeks ago we were in chapter 6, and then further on in the road in Romans, uh, we have to remember and remind ourselves that there are multiple covenants made with the people of God. That God has made covenants with his people. And, and in that covenant is if you want to remain in this covenant, God is saying with me, you got to do this or that. right? And, and the one covenant that stands out the most, like a sore thumb, right, is the law of Moses. Because that's when we get a lot of laws. That's when the people are hit hard with all these laws of what to do, how to do it. And what I mentioned a couple weeks ago when we were in chapter 6 was that the law re- kind of acts as an x-ray. And that it, show, it shows us uh, what is sin. It, it shows us in correcting us. But it kind of points the finger at us. And, and Paul kind of says it often in Romans about how the law kind of leads to death or how the law can, can condemn us. And he kind of plays to the tune of in the history of God's people, they followed the law but failed. And it was a continuation of the cycle of following and failing following and failing over and over and over again that one might look back and say I don't think that's working I don't I don't think this law is working as much as it should be because of our sinful ways and if you're crafty enough or deviant enough to have lived back in those days where you would kind of know the law you kind of know how to get around it or how not to get caught and that's kind of another aspect that plays a bit when we start to know the law. And what I want to get out a little more, if I can, is that there are even laws outside the Bible that we adhere to, right? In our own government and how our government is set up. But there are even laws that we are akin to without even knowing it. When we start our car, when we go to work, when we walk down a, a, a pathway when we throw a stone in the air. There are these things that we kind of have a common sense about that these, how our things run and ran within our reality. Our car needs gas or, or energy. Right? Our, our, our stomachs, we, we need sustenance we need water we need sleep we need vitamins these are are things that are there's a need base that if we do not follow something drastic will happen right and so there's like the the macro and micro if you will of of laws there and i say that to kind of ready ourselves for this passage because this passage will bleed into chapter eight so again uh, from last two weeks ago, sin, the law of uh, Moses, showcased sin the way kind of an x-ray will showcase a broken bone in our foot or in our, anywhere in our bodies. Our passage tonight is Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. Before I read, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you. Uh, that we can pick it up and read, Lord, and, and that we can believe in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Paul and his teachings to us that give us insight of, of who we follow and who we believe in and, and things that you want us to know, Lord, and your character in all of it, Lord. Lord, today as we open your word, Lord, we see the things that 
you'd want us to be about. We see how the interactions between you and the old covenant, Lord, between the thing that you've given us from the past to the thing that you've given us now, Lord, in the new covenant. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So starting with verse 1, chapter 7. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Verse 5, for while we were living in flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit of death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and in the old way and not in the old way of the written code. So I'm going to break it down really quick because this is uh, a bit of Paul introducing yet another topic from a different angle of what the law is and what it does and how we as Christians are supposed to walk according to Christ and his ways. So this first part in verse verse 1 is like the, the overview of this passage, right? For I am speaking to those who know the law. That the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So this is kind of that topical statement. This is him saying, this is what I'm going to be talking about. And we're going to get to some detail here. But before he does, he gives us a, an illustration, like an, an analogy, if you will. Verses 2 to 3, Paul gives us an analogy of the marriage, right? A marital law. Also to imply the Mosaic law. Mosaic law, which was given to Moses to give to the people. So this is something that Paul is doing yet again. Recalling Old Testament to compound it to show uh, comparisons and contrast for the people in this church in Rome. Now he even opens up for those who know the law. So there are people there also who know about the old ways or the old covenant, Moses' laws, who may have not been part of Abraham's physical bloodline. They could have been Gentiles who became converts. But many of them seem to know already, okay, we kind of know the story of Moses, yeah, the parting of the sea, the Ten Commandments, yeah, us too. Us too. Verses 4 through 6. This is what Paul wants us to know. This is also where we find our application of what Paul is saying. Verse 4 here, you have died to your old ways and have been raised anew in Christ Jesus. For us, in the year 2023, we kind of already know that. Well, they did too. And and as we get deeper into it, you're going to see, and many of you have already, in chapter 8, this is leading up to his, his infamous chapter 8 in the book of Romans. This is where it's all going. And for many of us Christians, and you know, I just thought about this the other day, the longer we live life, the more opportunities we have to sin. The, the longer and even wanting to live a long life, going out of our way to wanting a longer life, we, we expose ourselves daily already to temptations. So the longer we live life, the more frequently we get exposed. And for those of us who are in Christ, 
we're not reading our Bible and we're not praying daily. We're not always going to church. We're not getting discipled. We maybe go to one conference or a, a camp. That's not a good enough. There are about, what, 365 days in a year versus how many Sundays in a year versus however many times you get discipled in a year versus how many times you, you worship and pray daily if you, you can do that. And yet there's so many ideologies out in our world. There's so many things that we see every day, we're exposed to every day. That even here, now, and in the book of Romans, and their time, verse 4, you have died to your old ways and have been raised anew. So this is Paul saying, remember, remember. Why you were saved. Remember death. Remember heaven. Remember hell. Remember Adam, remember Noah, remember Moses. And he says, you people who know the law so well have this great foundation, but yet there's no faith. And for those of you who put forth works and effort, even as believers, we can get consumed with the works and say, look, look what, I, look what I've done. I'm a Christian now because I did what Christians ought to be doing. But that's not the case with Paul. Because that's what the law was doing for them too. Was providing this gateway into just works. And that if you're not doing these things of the law, you are not a believer. You're not part of Abraham's family. You're not part of God's family. And today we get caught up in that. Verse 5, while living in the flesh. While living in the flesh. This was interesting. A lot of uh, detail was in verse 5 here for the word flesh. That it was actually a callback to how they used to live in the desert. Before they got those Ten Commandments. And then even afterwards, it's a callback to how they used to be before they got the law of Moses. And then even after, before Jesus Christ. Verse 5, while living in the flesh. That's the callback to there. So Paul is bringing the people in Rome, whether they know the history or not, he's bringing it to them. Verse 6, Paul is also telling us that we are now free. Why does the Christian have to be reminded so often? Why? Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing the ascension of Christ? Can you imagine being there when, when they were all speaking in tongues? Thousands of people witness something great. Can you imagine being there to witness it? This person you've heard about named Jesus, whether you were a Jew or not a Jew, maybe you didn't believe, but you were there in a time, and then you witnessed something so great that you became a follower of Christ? To then five years down the road, ten years down the road, having, having to be reminded that you're free? This is our human condition even now. That even those who are following Moses, who were there when they saw the parting of the sea, saw the wonders of God, and yet they couldn't cross a river Jericho to the promised land. They had to be reminded you have to be reminded. I have to be reminded. And if there are 365 days in one year, and I'm going to live to however long, that's a lot of days I'm exposed to the enemy. 
that I am exposed to other ideologies, other covenants and ways of life and other laws that will take me from God. How often would I have to be reminded? How often will you have to be reminded? And I think this is so telling of when Christ tells his disciples, you got to clean your feet daily. I've met some Christians who didn't like that so much. They didn't like being called not perfect. And some of us might might have been on that road at one point. But man, our shoulders become so light when we realize I'm not perfect. That is why I need Christ daily. There are three things that I want to kind of pull from today's passage that kind of play to those tunes. The first thing in our passage here in chapter 7, it's this continued argument that Paul has on the things that that I'm just discussing right now with you. This continuation um, starts in chapter 5, but also in chapter 6. It really hits heavy there. Chapter 6, verse 15 and 23. I'm going to read it really quick. And I believe this is going to help us to, to kind of get deeper. Also, a refresher if we weren't here two weeks ago. What then are we <clears throat> what then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. So this is the, one of the arguments that's coming along. Righteousness. And I said before, weeks ago, that righteousness was coming before God, physically coming before God, that we would need righteousness. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawless leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end. What is its end? Eternal life. Now, Paul opens up the book of Romans with this type of contrast and talking points. He even opens up, I believe it's chapter 6 and 5, and, and kind of comparing Adam to Christ. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So what Paul is saying is, in this context, you church in Rome... You're having quarrels about should we follow the law or, or should we, can we sin because of grace? And Paul's saying, hold up. There's a bigger picture going on. There's this thing called the cosmos. He gets really big with it. He takes this church all the way back to creation in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And he even says, remember Adam, what he did? Remember what God did for him and the covenant thereof? 
Well, he failed. And when he failed that first covenant, there was this thing called the fall. So Paul really opens it up. But then he talks about Christ and in the future. That for all those who believe, when we die, when we go to sleep, there's eternal life everlasting. Because of Adam, we must die. Because of Christ, we can live after the point that we die. We can even start living now, as Paul would say. So the big context is always this life and death. So Paul is really getting into details, reminding the Christian of their walk and their faith, knowing the arguments of the church and the Rome. And it's the same arguments we're having today, but then he takes a step back and says, wait, don't forget your foundation. Yes, remember those laws, remember those covenants, remember why. And remember that when Christ shows up, where Jeremiah was saying in the Old Testament, there's a new covenant coming. No longer will we have to go to the temple. No longer will we need a priest. That this priestly king, this priest servant, this Messiah would be the thing that we need. That he will be our mediator. That God, Emmanuel, will be with us. Before Christ was coming, he was already talking about the new covenant. And he was talking to them before their exile in Babylon. They knew for a while. And yet even they had to be reminded. And Paul is still reminding us. And it's a callback to all the things that God wants us to be a part of. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, which is eternal life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second thing I want to point out to you guys is that part of this message tonight is the segue into the rest of chapter 7 which leads into chapter 8 and chapter 8 is kind of the climax of Paul's talking points here the argument is choosing life over death in how we live our life as Christians I'm going to jump ahead now to Romans 8, verses 1 through 8. And this is where Paul really is getting at. This is the point where Paul is telling us, reminding us, for the Christian, you know God's laws, you know God's ways, you know who Jesus Christ is, but it's a reminder for us. And it's, it's a truth. Verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has yet <clears throat> has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin <clears throat> he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, 
for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What is Paul talking to us about? There are laws at work, as I stated earlier. One of the biggest ones that we know about from the Bible is at the beginning. It is because of sin, because of disobedience, that Adam and Eve were kicked out. And it's because of the Mosaic Law, those Ten Commandments, to ready the people for the Promised Land, but to ready them to come before God because they don't have righteousness. We don't have righteousness who are not saved. And it's all about coming to the Lord, coming to God our Father, coming to God face to face. The unrighteous can't. God's law. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. There are many, many takeaways from that. But the biggest one is what Paul has been talking about all along when he started first talking about Adam versus Jesus Christ. Having to do with sin and death, and life everlasting. The spirit here, of course, is obviously when we as Christians start to adhere to God's dwelling in us. We as Christians will be tempted. Happens all the time. But then we choose the spirit in us, enacting in us. Finally, the third thing. Paul doesn't blatantly talk about it in our passage tonight, but he mentions it quite a bit in Romans. It's the rule of law. Many of you probably heard that phrase before, rule of the law. What he's talking about when it comes to the law, again, Mosaic law, is the the application of it. It is the these, it's, it's this law, that law, and this law that we have to obey by every day. Let me give you a quick, quick example. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we're driving down the road, I remember in the 90s, you didn't really have to wear a seatbelt. But now because of click it and ticket, y'all remember that catchphrase? We have to, right? So we get in our cars, we put our seatbelt on. Now there's going to be a couple people with a mindset that I put on the belt to stay safe. Because if I get in a car accident, I want to live. The other mindset is I put on the belt so I won't get in trouble. And then the other person who puts on the belt or doesn't put on the belt is not thinking in those, that line of, of thought. And so we look at the rule of law for different applications, either for safety, fear of God, or because we know we're we're evildoers and we don't want to get caught or don't want to get in trouble by the law, who God is the judge and creator of. So we look at the law, the rule of law, in different ways. For different reasons, we follow it. All right, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. Some of us don't want to do that. We don't want to murder someone just because it's not within us to do it. Some of us don't want to murder someone because we're followers of Christ and we're told not to. But have you ever met a murderer? I met a murderer. I met a couple of them. 
when I was working at Phoenix Rescue Mission, this guy told me how sorry he was, and he's changed man, and he's now a Christian, but he still has this guilt, this shame, because he murdered his dad. He spent 15 plus years in prison. He gave a testimony about it. It was in the heat of the argument, heat of the moment. His emotions got the best of him. And he ended up killing his dad. Was he thinking about the law? Some of us wake up in the morning knowing, God, look, today I'm going to serve. Today I'm going to pray. Today I'm going to do all these things. Today I'm going to follow your law. Today I'm going to make sure I go and spread the word and the gospel. Today I'm going to make sure dot, 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 dot. Now, if you're like me, you struggle to wake up in the morning. You're getting up thinking, ugh, where did I put my cell phone? I got to get to work, or did I take out the trash last night? You got other things in your mind that are more realistic in the now. But then when temptation comes, It's not me who recognizes it. It's the spirit within me. And it's really odd, to be honest, to be tempted and know it. My head can be down at my feet. Temptation comes and I get like a, a spidey sense, if you will. If you all know Peter Parker. And really, I, I just think to myself, I choose Lord, I choose Christ, I walk away. And I'm not thinking about laws. What I'm thinking about is my walk with Christ as a Christian. This is not right. This is evil or this is immoral. This is twisted. Yesterday, my son was watching PBS Kids. And uh, there was this uh, transgendered person on TV talking to kids about they can be whatever they want to be. I'm not thinking about the law. I wasn't thinking about what Al-Fadi talked about today. I wasn't like, oh, Genesis 2 verse blah, blah, blah. No. I sensed the evil from it. Now, when I wasn't a Christian, that wouldn't have been possible unless you knew the law. Unless you knew, oh, the Christian faith, this is incorrect. Oh, if you're a Jew, this is not good. Homosexuality is bad. There are people who know about our laws who are not Christian. And surprisingly, they'll follow our laws because it fits with their scientific laws that a man and a man do not work. A woman and a woman do not work. They don't, there's no kids from that. There's no fruit, if you will. You know who else likes our laws? People who want to have a government that fits our laws because our laws produce great morals, moral standards, moral living, good character, Y'all ever, ever heard of uh, Boy Scouts of America, the YMCA, Boys and Girls Clubs, some schools, the United States of America? Our laws work. As Christians, we know it. But yet Paul is saying that doesn't get you eternal life. It is the faith. And what are we being told now? We see it. Our laws are being changed and twisted, perverted. Some man, woman on PBS kids teaching my son, he can do, do and be just like that. When me as his father says, no, you have better gifting than that. I'm already aware of it. My wife and I talk about it. Your gifting is very godly because God made you a certain way to be a certain way. 
for me as your father and mother to both nurture you in this way, in God's ways. Now, I could teach my son laws, but what good would that do? The YMCA, years ago, in 2012, 13, they didn't allow for praying in their facilities. You couldn't pray. The Boys and Girls Club, I tried volunteering last year. They didn't like the idea that I was a pastor. So I hope this is a good example for you to understand that our laws, they're good, they're just not good enough. This is where you get the Pharisees asking Christ, what is the greatest law? And Jesus is saying, well, let me tell you what. They don't really work that well as they should. He even says, the greatest law is love. And it's interesting that Jesus says, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, right? With, with all your being, love God and love people. You know where that comes from? That comes from the prophets of Old Testament who knew God. You get a lot of prophets talking about give it all to God. You even get the wisdom literatures. Right? Solomon talking about it. Yeah, there is a fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. The end goal is love God. Adore him, revere him. And treat people as you would want to be treated. But for some odd reason, the Jews during Jesus' time failed to uphold that. They actually failed to uphold a lot of oracles and prophecy teachings. So much so that their biggest one, Jesus, is right there in front of them and they didn't recognize him. What good is the law is what I'm saying. It could tell you of the coming. It could tell you what to do, how to live life. You can go and put your seatbelt on because you want to obey the law. Or you can do it because it becomes natural. You want to be safe. I get in the car, tell my son, my daughter's already buckled in, and I tell him, put your seatbelt on. I'm not thinking about the law. Thinking about safety. And it becomes natural to now I don't ever really have to tell them a lot. We get in the car and I hear the clicker, the click of the seat buckle. It's the same thing with our walk with Christ. The law is good if we're beginning our walk so we can gain some understanding. But it doesn't work long term to get us to the end goal eternal life. Let me give you another example really quickly. Healthy living. Years ago, I was in sports um, with ASU. I was playing rugby. And healthy living, working out, health and fitness, same thing to me. But it was this whole eat right, sleep right, exercise train, go to practices, go to the tournaments, be available for whenever your coach says, hey, we're meeting now. I was new in my faith, and I had put that first. Because I was told, this is how you become the best. There's do's and don'ts. These are the programs we're running. And if you want to uphold to the program, and uphold to the end goal, which is being the best, then you got to do all these do's and don'ts. And you got to apply it. Workouts, this time on this day. Trainings on this time on this day. Eat this, eat that, don't eat this. Does that sound familiar? To the law? Here's where the covenant practice comes into play. That's just the rule of law. 
for the end goal program, the covenant of which I was in, which is health and fitness, to be the best what I was doing. I wanted to uphold that at the cost of not going to church, not being with family and friends, at the cost of my closest relationships, at the cost of being discipled by my pastor, at the cost of fellowship with other Christians, at the cost of my quiet time, my Bible studying. What became my covenant there of? Not God. It was sports. It was health and fitness. There are people today, Christians, who subscribe to similar things. And it it pulls them away from talking to sinners about Christ. It pulls them away from what we would call, um, well, you've heard of life groups, Bible studies, classes, discipleship. Y'all ever heard of parachurches? They go to a program rather than church because of the social activities or fellowships they have. Sometimes we as Christians get caught up in those things and slowly we start to be edging away from what God called us to do. So even as Christians, we have to identify when are we getting out of line because we're, we're either too much law or too much grace. And what I mean by too much grace is that Paul talks about it in chapter 6 here in Romans where the Christian here in the book of Romans was sinning because, hey, I'm forgiven. Christ forgave me so I can sin whenever I want to and then repent. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. So we as Christians have to understand when we are going too far left, too far right, too far up, too far down. And the way we see it is by our fruit. By our fruit. Metaphorically. Metaphorically, through Christ, going back to the garden, we can eat of the tree of life. The way, though, that God is attending for us today. And the crazy thing, ironically, it's through the Spirit of God we can produce the fruit of life because of Jesus, right? The way, the true, the life. This is the way we are a light unto the world. He gives us life, and we produce fruits of life while we remain in the Spirit of God. How do we know when we edge too far left and too far right? It's within our spirit with God, the dwelling part that we're supposed to produce something of a nature that shows that we are Christian. Years ago when I was at ASU, a friend of mine, he and I were eating at Subway in the MU, and I forget the conversation we're having, but it ended up being, hey, do you want to come to church or want to come to a youth night? And he looked at me, his mouth dropped open, you're a Christian? And I was like, yeah. I'm like, shh. Yes, I am. (laughs) He didn't even know I was a Christian. And I thought to myself, how did you not know? I should have asked him, but then I found out that he was going to a church and he wasn't saved. So our conversations were interesting. But it got me thinking, I wasn't walking the walk. I wasn't talking the talk. I was what you would call a lukewarm Christian or double-minded Christian. 
And yeah, I would show up to youth nights. I would go to camp. I'd go to church. What was going on? There's ideologies in the work that are not from the church. And, and Paul would say, you have strayed into a believing thought of a different gospel. It wasn't the church I was going to. It, it was me. I was running from God, and I was running to the enemy's camp, the world, and its multitude of ideologies. And for those of us today who are mature in Christ, we can sense when we see something afoot in the community that we would know this is something evil. This is a system that is from Satan. This is of the world. And that's where we want to be as Christians. At the same time, being a light unto the world, bearing that fruit, because Jesus is light. Jesus is righteousness. He is life. He gives forgiveness and grace. Compound that with the fruits of the Spirit that we get from chapter 5 of Ephesians and Galatians. Be joyful, even, even when things aren't where they should be, where we want to be. To be joyful that this is not the end goal. The end goal is a destination of what the Old Testament would say, the promised land of milk and honey, what Christ would say, his kingdom, that we can look forward to new heavens and new earth. Guys, God didn't come to save the pigeons. He didn't come to save the fallen angels. He didn't come to save all the zoo animals at Phoenix Zoo. He came as a human to save the humans. For what? We have to go back to Genesis. It was good. He created us in his image. It was good. He saw Adam and Eve. It was very good. God points at us, if you will, points at us, and through so many verses in our text says, those are my children, but you've been led astray. So I'm bringing one far greater so that you can come back to me. Do not get tied down into legalism, the do's and don'ts. Make it part of your nature to follow Christ. Make it part of your nature to see evil. Make it part of your nature to want to pray about whatever it is that comes to mind. Pray about the, the misfortune people. Pray about the Gentiles who don't know Christ. Pray about your families and friends who do. Pray about those you never even met. You just know they're Christian. They could be missionaries. They could be people you know for sure in a different state. You just never met them. Pray for them. Support each other. Bleed into each other. And don't be afraid when someone doesn't look like you. That is where you can find your fruits. How you react in those moments with people. Whether they're friend or foe, or someone you've never met before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, thank you that we can come to you, Lord, in a place like this, that we can call home and church, and friends and family are here, Lord, and thank you, Lord, that we can all come together in fellowship, worship you, Lord, pray for each other, Lord, and, and just find communion. Lord, thank you, Lord, 
Thank you for the world that you've showed us is to come and the one that we live in, Lord, and how desperate we need you. Lord, I pray for all of us here, Lord, that we come to you daily. That we can bend the knee, swallow our pride, and approach you humbly, honestly, and truthfully. Lord, I pray that if we're not bearing fruit, you speak into us to show us what's going on that we're not. Lord, help us to rebound, to come back to you. And for those of us, Lord, who have been walking this walk with you for so long, Lord, I pray that they can find someone to just pour all that wisdom into. They're not done with us so long as we live, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.